Good afternoon and welcome. I am Michael Kessler, Managing Director of the Berkeley Center and a professor in the Government Department and the Law Center. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation from the front lines, the global refugee crisis. The work of the Berkeley Center amidst the scholarly community of Georgetown University is to explore the role of religion within global challenges. We do this work in the firm conviction that a deep examination of faith and values is critical to address these challenges and that the open engagement of religious and cultural traditions with one another can promote peace. We aim to understand how religion is both deployed for ill and how religion is an enduring force in the world affirming the essential dignity of human beings and advancing the common good. The global migrant crisis has become one of the most critical and dire threats to human well-being and social stability. The esteemed journalists gathered today have been at the front lines of the issue, documenting the plight of displaced persons and their reception in and impact on their new host countries. Our panelists will join Professor Sean Casey, my colleague, director of the Berkeley Center and former director of the U.S. Department of State's Office of Religion and Global Affairs and, and an esteemed theological ethicist and political theorist in his own right. Uh, and they will discuss how communities worldwide have reacted to the refugee crisis. Sean will serve as the moderator of the event as well as a participant and introduce the fellow panelists in a moment. We are most grateful to the Henry R. Luce Initiative on Religion in International Affairs, a project of the Henry Luce Foundation, for their generous support of this project. Our partner in this event, the first of our partnership, is the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. Georgetown's Berkeley Center has recently become a partner with the Pulitzer Center's Campus Consor Consortium, a network of 27, 27 or now, 37 now, universities and community colleges that support in-person visits by Pulitzer Center jour journalists and international reporting fellowships for students. John Sawyer, the center's executive director and founding director, will now say a few words of welcome as soon as I introduce him. John's projects for the Pulitzer Center have included reporting from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, India, Bangladesh, China, Haiti, and the Caucasus. His work has been featured in the LA Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Al Jazeera, English, Neiman Reports, To The Point, PBS NewsHour, among others. We are pleased to work with you and your team as co-host for this event and look forward to the partnership. One last request, please make sure that all of your cell phones, noise-making devices, um, et cetera, are turned down. Thank you and welcome, John. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for being coming out today and being part of, of this important uh, discussion. And I want to say just uh, we are absolutely thrilled to be partnering with Sean and Michael, uh, their team at the Berkeley Center, then with, with Georgetown. The Pulitzer Center is a, is a nonprofit journalism organization, and our, our primary focus, our first focus, is filling gaps and reporting on big systemic global issues, and then working with our journalists to, to place those stories in the biggest possible outlets and engage the broadest possible public in, in those issues. And the and you'll, you'll be hearing from three of our best journalist grantees and, and the work that they've done in the discussion with Sean that will follow in a, in a moment. But I want to say just a, a word about the other part of the Pulitzer Center's work, which is the educational outreach. And as Michael was saying, we now have 36 or 37 uh, universities that are participating with us to, to bring this work out across the country. Uh, and, and, you know, we're in a moment, as you all are well aware, that, that we tend to be in our own silos. We're not talking to each other. And so even if you do work for the New Yorker or the Washington Post or Time or the Atlantic, some of that you'll be hearing about today. There are a lot of people in the, in the United States and beyond who not only don't read those outlets, they actively disdain them. And so we have to do something about rebuilding a community that, that follows the news, that understands the difference between quality, in-depth reporting and, and shallow, uh, superficial and biased reporting. And it's our vision at the Pulitzer Center that the only way we can do that 
is school by school, university by university, community college by community college. And so we're actively recruiting uh, every where we can to, to broaden that discussion and to, to get these issues out to the, to the countryside. And as part of the educational work that we do, any of the schools that are members of the campus consortium, uh, part of that, a good part of the funds go to support the work of journalists like we'll be hearing from today to come on campus and share their work. Uh, the other part is student travel fellowships that are, are available to every one of the campus consortium partners. And you'll be hearing, and those of you who are, who are students here at Georgetown or professors, uh, we'll be sharing more information about that. My colleagues, uh, Ann Peters and Kim Sawyer, are both here who work with that program, that part of the Pulitzer Center. So we're looking forward to working with, uh, with the entire Georgetown community. And lastly, I want to say that like, uh, like the Berkeley Center, uh, our work on, on religion and public policy issues has been made possible through support from the Henry Luce Foundation for the last uh, four, four and a half years. And, and we've been able to do projects all over the world with a lot of different outlets and, and do a number of uh, university engagements and conferences that we sponsored with their help. So we're deeply grateful uh, to Luce and of course to all of the donors who think that this, this, the journalism and the education that we do is a public good that needs, needs to be supported. And in many of those activities that I've had, I've had the good fortune of, uh, that we've done, I've had the good fortune to talk uh, with and to take advantage of uh, Sean Casey's extraordinary um, expertise and background and contacts. He knows everybody, as you all who know him here know that. And, and we've done conferences together. We've kibitzed on, on, on issues for years and years. And, and it's really, it's a treat for us, for me personally, to be able to, to be uh, working now together in this enterprise. So with that, I'll turn it to Sean and to our colleagues. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Just a couple of preliminary remarks, and we're going to jump right into our panel. Uh, first of all, thank you, John. I remember we first met about 11 years ago, and you, he told me this grand vision he had for the Pulitzer Center as American media outlets were shrinking their coverage of international stories. It really looked like a gloomy time. He had a vision for funding reporters around the world. I remember we met at Kramer Books and had lunch together. And I remember on, on my way back to, to Wesley Seminary, where I was teaching at the time, he said, you know, this guy's amazing, but it's going to take a miracle. Uh, so he's now in my category of miracle workers. The Pulitzer Center is up. It's robust. You go to their website and see the extraordinary range of, of issues and coverage that you have funded. Uh, and you see their impact if you watch the news hour, if you read the Times, you read the Post, you read New Yorker. Uh, so thank you for what you do. It's our honor to be your partner, and we're looking forward to many, many uh, fruitful partnerships going forward. For students, we have a fact sheet uh, on the table as you exit with the details of our inf interest meeting, which will be in McGuire 303 on Tuesday, December 5th at noon. So pick up the flyer. There's a point of contact, Claudia Winkler, in our office. If you have questions, email Claudia. Uh, if you want more information, grab one of the staff uh, during the reception. But, but do put this on your calendar. Make sure you, you grab that, that flyer. Uh, I'm, I'm so pleased. We, we have an extraordinary panel here. So I'm going to shut up, introduce our three panelists. And what we've essentially asked each of them to do is to take uh, 10 minutes or so. And this is Washington. 10 minutes all, it doesn't really mean 10 minutes. It means 10 minutes. And 30 seconds. And, yeah, 30 <laughs> seconds. I like that. I like it. Um, so what we've asked each, each of, of our panelists to do is to talk about the story or stories they have written about refugees. And you can go to the Pulitzer website to, to actually get links to the stories they've published. And they're all compelling reads. I mean, I've reread all of them uh, just this week and was reminded once again. So uh, without further ado, uh, to my immediate left is Robin Shulman. 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 Uh, Robin is a freelance journalist based in New York City who's had her work published in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Guardian. She's reported on a wide range of issues, including immigration, education, and the environment. She's a Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting grant recipient for a project about Syrian refugees in Canada and the United States. Uh, to her left is Alice Su, who is a journalist based between Amman, Jordan, and Beijing, China. Now, that's the largest patch I have ever heard anybody <laughs> identify, <laughs> which is extraordinary. Uh, her work focuses on stories of migration, religion, China, in the Middle East, 
and her work has appeared in the Associated Press, the New Yorker, and the Washington Post, among other outlets. She too is a recipient of a Pulitzer Center grant on her project investigating the relationship between different immigrant and refugee communities in Germany. And to my far left is Ben Taub. Uh, he too is a journalist and contributor to the New Yorker. His work on war crimes in Syria, which was supported by a Pulitzer a grant, was a finalist for the 2017 National Magazine Award and won the 2017 Overseas Press Club Award for investigative reporting. So with that, Robin, uh, take us off. All right, thanks so much. Um, so happy to be here and thank you to the people who've organized this at the university and also especially to the Pulitzer Center. I was just sitting and talking a little bit with Alice and Ben and hearing a little bit about their work. I got a preview and um, thinking, uh, wondering how much of this would be possible without an organization like the Pulitzer Center and what kind, of, yeah, none. <laughs> and what kind of stories um, we would be missing without this kind of support. It means so much uh, to freelancers and to news outlets uh, that are, um, increasingly constrained and, and not spending the way they used to, so it, it's, it means the world to us. Um, so I, I'm here to talk about uh, two stories I reported for the Pulitzer Center and, and actually continuing to pursue, and they're related stories about uh, Syrian refugees in Canada and the United States. Um, I wrote the first story for the Washington Post magazine, and I reported it in 2016, and um, it was about a unique program that Canada has that allows regular people to privately sponsor Syrian refugees. So any group of people can get together and decide that they want to help bring a family of refugees to safety, and they have to uh, do a tremendous amount of paperwork, fill out 60 pages of questions, um, go through a background check, um, and agree to uh, support the family financially, emotionally, socially, logistically, for one year, and uh, then they are matched with the family. They're offered uh, a choice of people who've already cleared background checks. They can decide things like, I would like to you know, have a large family because we have the resources to do that, or a family with special needs, or really I'd just like to have a single person, we can't raise that much money. They can make a lot of choices about the kind of people they would like to select, and then they get you know, a profile on a list and they choose, all right, that one. And then that family comes to them and is able to enter Canada because of um, the, the commitment they made. So um, I found out about this and I was intrigued because in the moment I found out about this, it was during the uh, US presidential election um, when we were having such a different conversation about Syrian refugees in this country. And um, I was fascinated because I didn't think, and it turns out we don't have the opportunity to do that kind of private sponsorship in the United States. In this country, there are nine resettlement agencies that are in charge of resettling refugees. So the government selects the refugees and the kind of parcels them out to these um, agencies that have contracts with the government to set them up in towns across the country that are generally selected because they have a low cost of living, they have easy transportation and jobs, and um, they might have a history of accepting refugees from that community. Anyway, it's a very different system and it was a very different political moment and a very different national mood. And so I became really fascinated by the, the enthusiasm in Canada where it seemed to be almost this national movement of people who wanted to help Syrians and everybody was doing it. There were um, you know, grandmothers who were clearing out their attics and offering up, you know, trying to find old silverware sets to donate yeah. to refugees <laughs> and um, people who were um, you know, creating space in basement apartments and say, hey, I can offer space to a Syrian family for a year. And, Everybody, um, I, I encountered the most unlikely groups of people who were doing it, like from a group of people who walked their dogs together and at the dog run in the park said, you know, I've been really bummed about this situation in Syria. What do you think we can do? Maybe we could sponsor a Syrian family. And then they did. <laughs> and a choir group did it. Um, many, many school groups did it. So parent associations at schools did it. And so the Syrian family came to that community and their children actually ended up going to school together with the um, Syrian family that they had sponsored. Um, so block associations, just pretty much any organization of people you can imagine seem to be sponsoring Syrian families. And it also seemed to have this kind of um, 
uh, snowball effect through the society because where here in the United States, so much of the conversation has seemed to be about um, hatred and suspicion and fear related to Syrian refugees, partly because nobody knows a Syrian refugee in this country because so few Syrian refugees have come here. Nobody has personal experience of Syrian refugees. Um, in Canada, there was this opposite effect where uh, the sponsored group would get together. They would ask 100 of their friends to contribute money. Those people would contribute money and, um, and a smaller group of them might also offer to contribute time and, and, and snow pants and all the other things that the family is going to need. And so um, these people then are invested. And so people go to work and they say, hey, how's that Syrian family that I you know, gave you 50 bucks? Um, you know, what's going on with them? And you know, they get status reports and um, you know, somebody's mother-in-law or sister-in-law who had no interest in refugees at all but knew that her family member was um, offering to drive them to doctor's appointments would then ask about it and be engaged with this issue. And so it seemed that it was kind of um, spreading through the society as something that people were engaged with because of a personal experience. And, um, and that was, the, then impacting the way that the Syrians were received. So I went to Toronto. I ended up meeting this family of four who were Syrian and he just, they just arrived through the private sponsorship program. Um, and I met them on what was to be the, um, the morning, I met them the day before their first day of school. The kids were starting school for the very first time. Um, there were two kids, uh, Reina and Naram, who were six and seven years old and the parents, Amir and Ragda. Um, the kids had never attended school before because they were babies when the war started in Syria and pretty soon schools shut down where they were from in homes. Um, and then they lived in Lebanon for several years and in Lebanon they lived in an area where there were a lot of Syrian refugees um, and a lot of uh, discrimination and even violence towards Syrian refugees. So they actually didn't feel safe sending their kids to school there because the, kid, the ch Syrian children in the area were being so much harassed. So the little girls were gonna go to school for the very first time, and also the parents were gonna go to school for the first time. Um, Amir and Ragda had left school when they were in seventh and ninth grade. Amir was a butcher, Ragda had never worked, and they were going to go back to school to learn English. And they realized just how critical this would be to their new lives in Canada. Um, uh, and so they all realized how much they were, um, how, much, how important this, this first day would be for all of them. Um, so let me start the slides. I don't know if, oh, you can see that, yeah, okay. Probably. So this is the, the, the morning of the first day. Um, they <laughs> were putting on snow pants. The sponsors had gotten together and contributed like a full winter wardrobe of stuff. But you can see that the clothes are not exactly fitting properly. <laughs> and um, the little girls were really excited about going. It, it happened that the morning that we were out, was it had just been the coldest weekend of the winter. It was like minus 30 degrees oh. Celsius. Oh. And um, there was a snowstorm in the morning. This is actually a photo from the end of the day when they were coming home from school because the pictures I took in the morning didn't work out because there was so much snow in front of my iPhone. Um, but they were trekking through the snow and kind of losing their balance and tripping and trying to gain their balance and giggling. And, um, and Amir was holding his phone. And I noticed that, and even in this freezing weather, he was holding it in his bare hand. And his, I mean, I was holding, my, trying to take pictures, so his hand must have been numb. Um, but I heard this voice coming from the phone, and it was saying, like, turn right in 200 meters <laughs> in Arabic. And so I realized that what Amir was doing was he was actually using his phone to navigate with Arabic language Google Maps to get the kids to school. He found himself in this new country. He couldn't read the street signs in English because he didn't know how to read English letters. But he had figured out how to use Google Maps. One of the sponsors had showed him how to use Google Maps on his phone in Arabic. And so that's how he was going and even doing neighborhood errands like the walk to school. And kind of um, in that moment, I, I had been thinking about the family as um, I was feeling very badly for them and I had you know, thought about all they had been through. They had been through, um, they, their house had been bombed while they were in it. Amir had been kidnapped for a period. They'd had to relocate twice in Syria and then in Lebanon. They'd been through a lot and I thought about all of this. But then in that moment I realized they're incredibly capable people. Like Amir figured out within a week of his arrival how to get around Toronto in Arabic and, and now he can go where he needs to get his family. And so um, uh, it was clear that Canada would be a cinch for him <laughs> given what they'd already experienced. 
And then I also was struck at this end of the day, and in general, on those first days that I met them, about how incredibly open and joyful they were, um, and, and full of fun. So on the way home from school, we saw the snowman across the street, and they had never seen a snowman before, and immediately, the whole family ran over and started posing for pictures with the snowman, and um, sending pictures and videos back to their family in Syria and Lebanon on, and, and Jordan on WhatsApp. And they were like lying in the snow making snow angels and um, they were really playful. And um, I, I, I realized too that um, this was not a somber experience of moving to the new country as I had imagined, like full of trepidation and fear. There was something else in it too and I asked them, I was told them later, I was struck by how playful and joyful you were. And um, uh, Amir told me, you know, when I arrived at an airport, we didn't know we were going to be privately sponsored by regular Canadians, but we just thought we were coming to Canada. And they told us, there's this family, there's this group of people that have raised money and they want you to come to this country and they're here to help you and they want to be your friends and advisors for a year. And he said, I just, Ragza said, it restored my belief in humanity. After everything we've seen, it made me believe in humanity again. And Amir said, you know, I just feel reborn here. And I could see that joy carrying into everything that they were doing. And I think that part of that came from the sense that they were welcome and um, wanted and supported. Um, this is the girls' bedroom. The sponsors had actually only found out that they were arriving like I think three days before they arrived. Um, they had expected their family would be arriving a month later. Um, but so they had had kind of like a late night furnishing party and they had stayed till up till like a, about 10 people had stayed up till two in the morning putting furniture together and going on last minute Walmart runs to buy more toys. And it was kind of interesting because everybody had uh, a vision of what it really means to be at home and how to welcome a family. And somebody said, oh, we've got to have, you know, more toys or more stickers in the kids room. And so like they went and they put stickers all over the place because that's what their kids have at home. So everybody had this different vision about how to make the family feel welcome. Um, and you can see too that it wasn't fully together yet. Like on the floor, instead of a carpet, there's a red cross blanket um, because it was freezing and they needed a carpet and they had been given this red cross blanket when they had entered the country. But um, the girls were thrilled to have their own room. They'd never had their own beds before. Until this time, they'd all slept in the same bed with their parents because their life had been so much on the run and they'd always been moving to new places. Um, and these are the two possessions the girls brought with them. The only thing they had from babyhood was these teddy bears. Um, and so they had brought them with them to Canada. This is a picture of the family together with the sponsors, the main sponsor group, um, which was a Canadian couple named Ashley and Allie and Ashley's sister Mallory and Ashley and Allie's daughter. And really, they had asked to be matched with a family that also had young children because their vision was that this shouldn't be like charity work. They didn't want to feel like they were giving everything and the family was receiving everything. They wanted to feel like this was a family they had something in common with and that they could raise their children together. Um, and this is actually the person who inspired their sponsorship effort. Um, it, Ashley had had the idea to sponsor a Syrian family, but she had just gotten back gone back to work after the birth of her daughter in a high pressure job as um, management in a nonprofit agency. And she just said, you know, it's just not a good time. I'm just trying to figure out my own family. I can't sponsor a Syrian family. And then her housekeeper mentioned in passing, this is her housekeeper, Kathy, Kathleen McElroy. She mentioned in passing that she was sponsoring a Syrian family and that she was working with her church group and she had raised $40,000 selling chicken on a bun at a fundraiser. And so Ashley wow. said, all right, if she can do this, we can figure out to do this too. Um, so they did. And just very quickly, the, the school was great. Um, Reina was in a tiny ESL class and it was clear from day one that she was gonna do great. Um, Naram, the younger daughter on the other hand, was in a big kindergarten class because they didn't have ESL for kindergartners. And she just kind of was wandering around the class very dreamily, um, looking, um, not really focusing on anything and not engaging. And I started to wonder if maybe she had a disability, maybe there was something that had impacted her during the war that would affect her learning and development because she just seemed in her own little world. Um, later, I found out that she had actually needed glasses. And so that might have been part of the problem. She, they had never had consistent medical care. They certainly hadn't been to an ophthalmologist. 
Um, so a year later, when I caught up with them again, she had glasses and she was the class, the most vocal kid in the class. She was, um, uh, the teacher told her that she was her best helper. And the, here's a picture of the girls at the end of the day. They were so happy to see each other. I realized too that they had never been apart. So through all they'd been through, they'd always been together and going to school for the first day in Canada was scary because they were not with each other. So they were so happy to be together again. And last picture of them um, is Rugza studying English on her computer. And I love this picture because you can just see the intensity in her expression. And um, in, in Toronto and in Canada, they have, um, anybody could attend full-time English classes for free, and that's what they were doing. Very soon, Rugza was at the top of her class, and she's since placed out level after level. Now, um, a year later, just to give you a very quick update, the whole family is fluent in English. Um, I don't need any translation at all. Like, we can talk about any topic they want, all of them, in English. And um, Amir is working in his profession as a butcher at a big grocery store. He just got a promotion. He's a manager of the store. It struck me how the sponsor relationship contributed to his success because um, when he first got the job, he went to Ali and told him how happy he was to have the job. And Ali said, how much money are you making? And he told him $15 an hour. And he said, what? You're a skilled butcher. You can do better than that. Ask him for more money. So he went back and asked for more money and he got a raise and now he's actually the head of the meat department. He manages, I think, a dozen other workers, many of them Canadian born. Um, so he's just done incredibly well and that kind of um, support from the sponsor comes up everywhere. Like Ali mentioned, oh, we have this thing in Canada where you can save money for education tax-free. And Amir the next day went to his bank and opened account, an account to direct deposit a portion of his paycheck for tax-free savings for the girls' education. So um, you can see that support coming through in all kinds of ways. Um, Ragda is now pregnant with a third child. They'd always dreamed of having three or four kids. And they're, all, they're so excited about it. And um, they want to name her uh, an English name and have this child be fully Canadian and not have the experience of war that they all had in the past. And the girls are just doing incredibly well. They're almost at grade level. I don't have time to talk about Amir's sister who was resettled in Iowa. Um, who I followed and wrote about for Time Magazine and who lives in, now in Des Moines and who's been here almost as long as them. But the short version is they didn't have that kind of support. Um, they were resettled by a big refugee resettlement agency that was overwhelmed. Even emergencies like their daughter's um, abscessed teeth that were causing her so much pain she was having trouble functioning and going to school, they weren't addressed for months after their arrival. Um, and the kids, even a year later, it's been more than a year now since they've been in the United States, and nobody in the family speaks fluent English, and they're just struggling in many ways. But I'm happy to talk more about that in the questions. Um, Thank you. This is really a quick look at the <laughs> Iowa family, and over to you. Okay. So I'll just get started. So... My project is, it's similar to Robin's in that I'm also looking at refugees in newly arrived in a Western country, but I focused on the issue of religion. Um, and I was drawn to this question because I'm a journalist usually based in Jordan. I report from the Middle East, so I'm familiar a lot with refugee survival and why refugees flee from war. Um, but I was curious what happens when people from the Middle East arrive in a Western country, um, how do they integrate and what role does faith play in that? Uh, um, and I think I, I really wanted to get into this question in Germany, one, because Germany had the most open policy out of all the European countries. They took in the most refugees. Um, and also because it seemed to me that there were two key narratives that were being heard in Western media about refugee resettlement. And one of them is kind of this far right, um, uh, kind of very, a uh, fearful narrative that says, you know, the Muslims are coming and they're bringing Sharia law, it's very scary. And fundamentally, I think that's, there's a premise there that says, you know, Islam is not compa compatible with the West. We can't have Muslims, we can't have too many Muslims here. Or if they come, they're gonna have to behave differently. And then there was another narrative that was kind of all about um, refugees welcome, uh, no human is illegal, everybody should come here. Um, of course, I lean more towards that narrative because of my bias, which is, I have lots of Syrian friends, I have lots of refugee friends, and I believe that everybody deserves a safe place to live. Um, at the same time, 
uh, when I was reporting, something that was really interesting to me was that it seemed like there was no space in between those two narratives. It was either refugees are all bad or refugees are all good. So what I was trying to do in my work was to try to nuance that a little bit and to bring out that their religion is a really tricky subject. It's very sensitive and there are huge differences between the way that religion functions in the Middle East and here. And when people come from that region to this region, they do experience huge shock and they do experience large difficulties in integration and a lot of that does have to do with their faith. So that's what I was trying to explore. Oops, I just pressed the wrong button. Okay, <laughs> it's back. Um, so <laughs> from this slide, uh, this slide, one of them, uh, the picture on the right is uh, uh, from a mosque. The first night I got into Berlin. Oh, so yeah, I spent a month in, in Germany <laughs> exploring this, this question. Um, the first picture is from a mosque, a local mosque, where I attended an iftar because it was Ramadan, and there, were, there was a group of refugees there um, who had been invited by this integration group, and they said, let's go have iftar together, and we'll have refugees and German kids together, and we'll talk about, we'll talk about what, what Ramadan is and try to understand each other. Uh, and we'll, you know, yeah, so, so they're praying there. And then the second picture is um, this just graffiti, that's not graffiti, it's, it's just uh, something on a wall, and it says no humans are illegal. Um, and so, the first thing that surprised me about my reporting was that in a lot of shelters, well, first of all, it surprised me that there are still shelters in Germany. The peak of the refugee crisis was in 2015, but now, two years later, in many of the cities and small towns, people are still living in large auditoriums, in sports halls, in rooms that are just kind of makeshift rooms divided by <laughs> curtains. I was so surprised by this, because that's what I had seen in places like Iraq. Um, where when ISIS was new and people were freshly displaced and I spend so much time with people who wait five, six years in Jordan saying, I can't, one day I'm going to get to Europe. And in my mind it was, oh, once you get to Europe, you're going to settle, you're gonna have a new life. But actually a lot of people, they've been there for two years and they still haven't even found a place to live. They're still living in shelters. And in shelters, what happens, a big problem that many shelter people told me about was that people don't integrate well because they're still stuck within kind of a society within a society. And, and I heard from multiple people in different shelters that sometimes after two years living all together in a small space, you start seeing the same problems that exist in the Middle East in this kind of microcosm mini society. For example, there was one shelter where the German lady, an Iranian German woman who was running the shelter told me, she said, you know, we had these problems with these two conservative men in our group. They're just two men who, <laughs> People were getting along, but they started going around and telling people, "You need if you're a good Muslim, you need to behave this way or that way. They started making all the women wear hijabs and saying, and she said, so we started seeing women who, <laughs> when they left the shelter, they would take off their hijabs because they felt very pressured outside, <laughs> like to look more German. And when they came back in, they would put on their hijabs <laughs> because they felt pressured at home, um, at home, like in the shelter to conform to Middle Eastern standards. And then there would be people who would be saying, um, who would say, you know, we want to separate uh, all the women should, should stay over here on this side of the sports hall and all the men should be on this side. They're, and the same men, they were saying, uh, um, we don't want to stand in line with the Christians to receive food because we think they're dirty. And I think some of these problems, they're, they're very sensitive. And when I bring them up, I don't mean to say that that is Islam or that that is, that is what refugees are like because it was only two men. It was just two conservative men who were imposing this behavior on everybody else in, in the small mini society. But I think it's healthy for us to acknowledge that when you allow a parallel society to grow, people can enforce the same social norms within, within that society that may be very different from what's, what, what's in the mainstream society outside. And so this woman was telling me, she's saying, we have big problems because we're trying to tell the people here, this is Germany and Germany, you know, we're all equal and you can, all, you can do what you want, you can dress as you like, but, they're, but people are feeling, pre feeling pressured from one another. Um, and she's saying, this is a problem and it's happening because people are not integrating with the outside world. They're still staying in their bubbles. And, and to some degree that happens even when people leave the shelters. And that's something that really surprised me as well because I spoke to a lot of newcomers, um, newly arrived people from Syria, from Iraq, from Iran, Afghanistan, and so on. And a lot of people, I won't say this is all refugees, I'm not gonna make any blanket statements, but a lot of people told me, I asked them, okay, do you go to mosque? Um, how do you find the Muslim community here in Germany? Uh, um, and the vast majority of people said, no, we don't pray in mosque. And I, I, I was like, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean for your faith? And they said, no, no, like we're still Muslim, but one, on a very practical level, we're busy, we're trying to learn German, <laughs> we're trying to work, we're going to school, and we have work and school on Friday, so we just don't pray at the mosques. But also, a lot of people told me that they felt uncomfortable in some of the mosques, and I think it's kind of counterintuitive because there's a narrative that, oh, <laughs> Middle Eastern Syrians are coming, they must be so extreme because that's where ISIS is. But actually, a lot of Syrians that I met told me, we feel that the mosques here with the 
immigrant community that's been here for several generations is far more conservative than the kind of mosque that we went to in Syria. <laughs> and a lot of Syrians also, they're like, we're Muslim, but you know, I'm from Damascus, and, and they're very cosmopolitan, and so they, they interpret religion in, in, in a huge range of ways. Um, so this is just a challenge, kind of, just a challenge initially some of those assumptions we have that there's this binary and there are like extreme people coming from this region and very moderate people in this region. Actually, uh, in Germany, the largest um, Muslim community pre-existing before the refugee crisis was Turks. A lot of Turkish people uh, um, came to Germany after World War II to uh, rebuild the country and, and they didn't have the kind of integration policy Germany has now. They didn't, for example, right now in Germany, they, they pro also provide language classes. They do all this stuff to try to get people employed and in school. But back then when Turks came, like they just came and they did some manual labor and they didn't learn German. And now there is very much a sense of a parallel society in many places where people don't speak German, but maybe they're second, like they, they've been there for, for decades um, and they kind of live in neighborhoods where everybody is Turkish and they, they, don't, they don't associate with outside and they don't consider themselves very German or they consider themselves, themselves more Turkish than German. Um, so I thought one way to reapproach the way we think about refugees and religion, instead of saying, oh, oh, it's like Islam is coming to the West, oh, is that going to work or not, um, is to reframe um, this in the, through the lens of agency and to think about individual refugees. And instead of asking, um, is Islam compatible with the West, we can ask when refugees or when people come to our Western societies, are they afforded the same kind of agency that we have um, in, West, in Western societies where we, we kind of assume and take for granted we have this in individual rights, individual choices to believe what we want to believe. Religion, religion is very personal and private, but when we, when we talk about refugees and when they come, are we also thinking of, of them that way? And so I, I put these two quotes together <laughs> because um, I wanted to bring up these two women that I met. I think it's always really interesting to approach <laughs> subjects from women's perspectives. Um, so there's these two women I met. They're both Syrian. <laughs> They're both refugees. One of them, her name is Aya. She's, no, no, her name's not Aya, sorry. Her name is Yara. She's 23 years old. She's from Hama, and we met in Berlin. Um, I met her as part of this kind of Syrian group that was trying to talk about how they could contribute to Berlin and contribute to German civil society, and they wanted to like open a cultural center. And I was talking to her. She's Sunni Muslim by background, but um, she considers herself very liberal, kind of secular. It was Ramadan, <laughs> she was wearing like a black tank top, a lot of eyeliner, she's eating chocolate. <laughs> I was like, okay, you're not fasting. <laughs> um, and she told me, she said, I told her my subject, and she told me, you know, honestly, for me, the pressure that I feel is not coming from German society, the pressure I feel is coming from Syrian society. And she said, in Germany, I, I feel like we've brought the same problems that we had in Syria. We still have the sectarian religious people who are arguing, against, are arguing with um, kind of the liberal secular people. And she told me, so there is this street in Berlin, Sonnen Alley, and it's, it has, it's gotten this uh, nickname as the Arab Street because a lot of Arabs have set up shop there, selling Lebanon, Zaka, or falafel. Um, and uh, Yara told me when she walks on that street, she wears a cross necklace. I was like, why do you do that? And she said, I wear a big cross necklace because then I can pretend to be Christian. I don't agree with this, but if I'm Christian, people think I'm more open-minded. Otherwise, Arab men approach me, people that I don't know, and sometimes they're Syrian, sometimes they're Palestinian or Lebanese, and they come and speak to me, and they say like, Ya Uhdi, what are you wearing? You need to cover up. Uh, you need to preserve our honor. Um, are you fasting? And she, and she was telling me, I was really surprised that I came to Germany, and I'm still wrestling with these issues. A week later, I met another woman, and <laughs> this woman, um, her name is Avin, she's 27 years old. She's a Kurd from Kamishli, and I met her in Cologne. And she was so funny, so I met her, and she said, I told her about my project, and she asked me, she said, oh, can you recommend some mosques for me? <laughs> and I was like, um, I don't really know. I've been interviewing people in mosques, but I don't know. What, I, was, I asked her, what do you mean? And she said, because I've been searching and searching for a mosque. She had been in Germany for a year, and she said, I'm looking for a mosque because I want, I just want a place where I can talk about my faith openly and not be told what to believe and not be told if I'm a Muslim, I should do, do this or that. So I'm, I'm looking for a place because I'm really, I'm really confused. I, and her big question was whether it was okay to take off her hijab or not. So for her, she came to Germany. She had been wearing her hijab for many years and she had never even thought about like, what does that mean? And she said, for the first time I felt like, and she has a master's in engineering. And she said, I felt like, People were looking at me like I was a backwards person. Like they just, she's like, you just get on the public transportation and people stare at you and then they talk to you and then, and then they, they're surprised and they're like, oh wow, like you're, you're not extreme at all. And then she would say, oh yeah, of course, of course I'm not extreme. And she wanted to take off her hijab because she felt uncomfortable with it. 
but then <laughs> she didn't know if that was okay <laughs> theologically. So, but she, at the same time, she felt that the mosques that she went to were all very hardline and just telling her, you have to behave this way or that way. So instead, she went to the internet and just like Googled, can I take off my hijab? <laughs> and she was like reading all these forums for a year. And after a year, she took it off. And I asked her how she felt. She said, you know, I feel better. Like, I feel better in German society, but I'm not sure if it was the right thing. And I, I bring up these two women to show that <laughs> for both of them, religion played a role in their integration or lack thereof. And I think it played an, in, in many ways, religion played an, uh, an obstructive role for them in feeling accepted in their, their new society. But it's interesting because for one woman, <laughs> she felt like she couldn't adjust because her, she was seen as part of this people group and her people group tried to tell her, you have to behave a certain way and this is the norm you have to be or else you know, you're not part of us. The other woman, she was also trying to adjust and integrate, but the other group was telling her, no, you have to behave this certain way. Uh, um, and I think it just, it just helps for, it helped for me to think about this, to realize, okay, um, maybe the big problem is not so much that Islam is different from Western culture, but that people use religion to try to tell others how to behave and they try to impose norms on others and it can come from both directions. Uh -huh. And in the Middle East, you know, oftentimes people are, are pressured to behave in ways that they didn't want to behave. Um, and we think, and we should think, you know, if, if they come, people come to, be up on the basis of religion, and we just think if you come to the West, if anything, the big difference should be here. We have rule of law, we have civil liberties, we have individual choice, so here religion should be your choice, and you can decide what to wear and what to believe, and nobody should pressure you. But the reality is right now, the way that we talk about refugees, oftentimes we are taking agency away from them, and we are, because we start off on, a, on this kind of basis of distrust, we don't let them make their choices, and, and I think, <laughs> and I'll try to be fast with this last point. Uh, the, this comes through the most clearly in the question of conversion. Um, and that was something that was so interesting to me because um, it's just a very controversial thing that happens when refugees come to Germany and they change their religion and they become Christian or they become atheist or they want to go from one religion to the other. And you question and you wonder like, oh, is, are you, why are you changing your faith? Is it because you want to be better accepted or is it because it's going to help you in your um, asylum acceptance interview? Because if you say I'm Christian, then you, you have this case that you're persecuted at home, so maybe you can, you, you have a higher chance of being accepted. Um, I do have, wait, I have a really brief video to show. This is, this is from, okay, I'll just, I'll just play it first and I'll explain it. Berlin, um, at a church filled with Iranian and Afghan converts, and they're having communion, and they're singing a worship song in Farsi. When you watch this video, like, I don't know how you feel. <laughs> Maybe it's just like, that's weird. <laughs> Why are they doing that? <laughs> They're doing something that's not from their culture. <laughs> um, I went to this church because I heard about it uh, from a friend, and I interviewed this pastor. And he was telling me that at the peak of the refugee crisis, they were fostering this congregation of 1,300 people all converts, and he was doing these mass baptism, ba baptisms. He said, yeah, we had 200 people at once. They <laughs> were just like baptizing them, <laughs> like all these new Christians. Um, and I think if you're coming from an evangelical background, you might say like, oh, wow, like great, <laughs> like new Christians. If you're a journalist or kind of skeptical, you'll say, okay, what is going on? <laughs> like, are they really all becoming Christian? <laughs> like, um, and for me as a reporter, it was really tricky to navigate this because you hear so many different narratives. Um, I interviewed the head of DTIB, which is the biggest Islamic organization in Germany, and it's this Turkish organization, and it's very controversial because they have a lot of mosques, and they staff their mosques with people who are employees of Dianet, which is the Turkish government's religious bureau, so it's weird because you have Turkish government employees essentially in German mosques, and he was very opinionated. He was saying, like, these churches are so manipulative. <laughs> this is abuse. How can you give a Bible in one hand and bread in the other? And, you know, they're just... They're just trying to, you know, steal our Muslims and make them Western. And, and he, you know, he didn't like it at all. Um, and then when I talked to 
uh, people from the mainstream churches, because there are two mainstream Catholic and Protestant churches, and they're doing most of the um, relief activity, but they actually take care not to convert people. They're trying very hard to be humanitarian. They're trying very hard to say, our faith <laughs> means that we care about people based on their need, and so we're going to serve Muslims and Christians. And this story started out as a story about church asylum. That's where that first, first quote is from, and it was a story for the Washington Post about how there are hundreds of churches that are offering asylum to rejected asylum seekers. So technically, if, they're, if people get their um, requests rejected and the German police don't deport them within six months, they can appeal again. And they can appeal again for asylum in Germany. So these churches, they say, come and live in the church for six months. You don't leave the church for six months. Like, you stay in the building. And in those six months, the police don't come into the church. And then after the six months, they can appeal again. And that's not enshrined in law. That's just the norm. Like, it's not like the police can't come in, but they just respect. And they say, OK, <laughs> this is a sanctuary. So it's something that the churches are doing, which I found really fascinating. And, they, and I asked them, you know, I mean, so you're kind of going against the government in this. And they said, and this woman who I interviewed, she said, yes, well, sometimes from a humanitarian or a Christian view, the law is not correct. And I was like, wow, it's so radical. Um, like, um, but anyway, when I did the story, I stumbled upon this topic of conversion. And I just, I just, it was hard for me to figure out how to deal with it. Um, something that was really compelling that the pastor said to me was he said, you know, when people are coming to us and saying, we don't want the faith that we had, or we don't want what we experienced in Iran and Afghanistan, it's also somewhat patronizing for me to tell them, well, no, like you, are, you came as a Muslim, so you must stay a Muslim. Or for me to tell him, there's a better Islam that you just don't know, so I'm not going to let you come into my religion. And he said, I think that's a form of patronizing to people as well. So if they want to enter my religion, I'm going to let them come in. Um, and you know, actually they should choose. That really challenged me. But even so, as I was interviewing people, I found myself very skeptical. You know, like there was this one man, he's just like, I was like, so why are you a Christian? <laughs> and he's telling me, he's like, Jesus is going to help me stay in Germany. And I said, OK. <laughs> and I said, well, I was like, is that why you believe in him or you love him? He said, yes. <laughs> and I, I just kept pushing him. And I, I felt like, who am I to push on this? Because it's so personal, right? But I was just like, what if Jesus doesn't keep you in Germany? Like, <laughs> Do you still believe in him? And he was like, no, but he's going to keep me in Germany. Jesus will keep me in Germany. I was like, but what if he doesn't? And, you know, and in the end, he said, OK, if he doesn't, you know, God is great, and I will listen to him. And I was like, OK. And, and, but I mean, like, I think um, one guy that I met, and I want to just like um, talk about him a little bit. No, stop. OK. <laughs> Um, this quote on top, he's, it's this convert I met. His name is Saeed. Um, he was 32. He was in this church. Um, I was interviewing him, and I was feeling very skeptical. And he was telling me his whole story. He said he was arrested in Iran and whipped three times, um, all three times for being caught uh, with a girlfriend, partying, doing alcohol and drugs. And because of that, he turned away from religion. He became an atheist. He said, I hate religion. It's just a form of social control. It's so fake. It's so politicized. Later on, he became drawn to Christianity. And then he told me that he was caught with a Bible in his car <laughs> coming back from some meeting. And so he fled. Eventually, he went to Norway. He was rejected for asylum in Norway after a year, and then he came to Germany, and then he was rejected in Germany because, according to the Dublin regulation, you should like you should go back to where you first came in. Um, anyway, he had church asylum, and after two years, he was still here. Um, his parents had recently gotten divorced because his parents started fighting with each other. His mom was saying, just bring Saeed back. We can pay money. We can make it safe for him. And his father said, no, it's not safe for him. And, they split over this fight, and he started telling me how guilty he felt, and he was saying, I've started drinking alcohol more and more, and like I'm just really lonely. I don't really know what's going to happen. And then I asked him this question. I said, what do you think of, because I felt that he had opened up to me, and I said, what do you think about this thing that people say, which is you guys are all fake converts, and you're just trying to get, uh, get a place in Germany? And he just told me, very frankly, he said, I hate this question. I can't believe people ask me, you know, did you just, are you just pretending so you can have a better life? And he said, do you think I chose to do this? Like, do you think I chose to become a refugee? You think, he said, I had everything in Iran. I had a house. I had a wife. Like, I miss my wife. <laughs> I had a car. I had, a, I had work. Um, I didn't, you think I chose to be here to be alone and hiding for two years? Like, I, I chose Christ, okay? I chose my religion, but everything else, I didn't have a choice. Um, and I think that's something that we forget a lot when we <laughs> talk about Muslims or you know scary people coming and trying to clash and change our society is that people don't have a choice and mo people don't choose to become refugees. Like no nobody nobody wants to become stateless. Nobody wants to live in a camp that's like a prison in the desert in Jordan. Nobody wants to take a boat or go across the desert, as Ben will tell you guys about next. Um, and I think if we want to treat 
refugees as people with dignity, they're already people who have had agency removed from their lives in almost every conceivable way. And they're also people who are typically still undergoing trauma, either from something they've experienced or because their family members are still in war. And there are so many people in Germany who would tell me, you know, <laughs> like, my family members were in a chemical attack or were hit by a bomb. Their families are still dying. So they're still undergoing trauma. They have so much taken away from them. And the very least we can do is to afford them the agency to say who they are and to decide, decide how they want to be identified and decide what they believe and what that means to them and not to quickly slap a label and say, you're, you're a Muslim and you must stay Muslim or you're a refugee and therefore I don't trust you. And I think sometimes we have this kind of self-fulfilling distrust. That came through really clearly in Germany because I met so many people who, who had this feeling like, okay, I come here as a Syrian and people say like, you're so scary, you're a Muslim, you must be a terrorist. But then the people who try to be Christian, it's like, oh, you're a fake Christian, you're not really a Christian. So I think if you, if you start off on this foot of thinking, these people are different from me, therefore I don't trust them no matter what they do, that's only going to alienate them further, it's going to obstruct integration, and that's actually going to hurt us because when people are alienated and not integrated, then, then they are susceptible to extremist narratives, and maybe then you know, terrorism happens and so on. And, and just the very last quote, um, it's from my friend Jabbar, who I met in Cologne. He's this guy who's from Raqqa. He fled first from the government, and then his family was stuck under ISIS. Um, and he's an archaeologist. <laughs> he studied archaeology in Aleppo and Alexandria, and now he works at a museum in Cologne. And I talked to him about going to mosque or church or whatever. He said, you know, I don't like going to religious places because I hate being treated <laughs> like a project. He said, every time I walk into a mosque, people come up to me and they say, what's your name? And they say, oh, are you a refugee? And they, they say, oh, I want to help you. But after a while, helping you means they start asking him, like, oh, what do you believe? What do you believe about Muhammad? <laughs> like, they try to, he said they try to convert you and they try to make you like them and you start feeling like you're just a number, you're not a person. And he said this, I thought this was so striking. He said, I want to go to mosque like I go to a cafe. Like I just want to, I want to be anonymous. Like I don't want anybody to ask me who I am or where I'm from. Like I don't want to stick out. I just and he said that's how I want people to talk about Syrians as well, not Syrians as Muslims or Syrians as refugees, but just Syrians as people. Um, and people again, going back to the first point, people are not all good and people are not all bad. People are good and bad, and refugees are the same. <laughs> and if we allow the narrative to be, you know, polarized in this way, I think it's going to be very harmful for us um, in terms of whether we can really integrate. Um, yes, and that is that that is where I'll stop. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So um, I, I'm going to sort of focus on a small town in northern Niger and, and how its well-being in a surprising way is very much in the interests of the national security uh, in the United States and in Western Europe, the, um, sort of since that seems to be the only lens through which uh, a lot of governments today want to view anything of substance. Um, so last, actually exactly a year ago, I went uh, with support from the Pulitzer Center. I went on a uh, rescue boat run by Doctors Without Borders. And it was leaving, it was sort of for the, the there's a couple of different migration routes. Everyone sort of knows a lot of the Syrians, Iraqis, Iranians, Afghans come through, uh, through Turkey and go through the Balkans or other routes. Um, most sub-Saharan Africans, uh, whether coming from East or West Africa, end up in Libya because its coastline is completely impossible to police, and it's about a thousand miles wide. And um, so the EU pays coastal African nations to basically police their water borders. But uh, after Libya fell to pieces, uh, that became one. Uh, it became a haven for smugglers um, because there was no one saying. You can't run a connection house, which is basically where you store migrants for a while, um, and launch them off the coast of Tripoli or wherever else. Um, and once they reach international waters, they are, it is, maritime law requires that any boat in distress is rescued by the nearest boat. Um, so I was with Doctors Without Borders, and we went down, we left from Malta, we went down to the coast of Libya, did a few laps for a few days, and then one morning, the weather sort of evened out, the boats were able to launch, and we came across this rubber dinghy uh, with about 130 people on board. Uh, it left Libya with only enough fuel to reach international waters, 
and um, but it wasn't as if the boat was designed to get any further than that anyway. Uh, basically, the original dynamic is that um, after the fall of Gaddafi, a lot of uh, his henchmen were trying to convince Europe of the stakes of his collapse, and as a result, they were packing um, African guest workers from sub-Saharan Africa um, into wooden boats, you know, six or seven hundred people at a time, and launching them in the direction of Europe, often against their will. Um, and so when there were, well, there was a major mass drowning off the coast of Lampedusa in 2013, and it was the first time that the drowning happened a quarter mile from the coast of Europe, and so people watched for a week as the Coast Guard recovered all the bodies. And that sort of changed the thinking about this. Um, it was October 3rd, 2013. And so as a result, the Italian Coast Guard started carrying out rescues, uh, started real ref rescue operations, and when they started doing that, the smugglers realized, well, we don't need to send them in boats that can even make it to Europe. We just have to get them into international waters. And so they started putting people in dinghies. And now, of course, the Italians and European governments tend to blame rescue uh, operations run by NGOs as being a pull factor uh, for all these boats. But in fact, it was rescue operations that began as, a, as an EU effort. Uh, and then they sort of pulled back, and the, the NGOs realized there is this void. If we don't step in, every single one of these people will drown. Um, uh, I, what was interesting after the rescue, though, was that actually the migrants were mostly, uh, these were mostly migrants, some refugees, um, uh, difference being rather than fleeing war in many key cases, people were fleeing desperation and poverty, um, which uh, was changes their legal status uh, upon arrival in, in Italy. But most of these um, migrants, when you ask about the most difficult part of their journey, do not mention the sea. Uh, because what they actually endured in the desert is far worse. I'm going to play a, a few audio clips. This is from a Ghanaian political refugee describing the abuses in southern Libya. If you enter and you didn't pay your money to the connection man, you will suffer. Beatings. Beatings. Morning time, they will beat you. Afternoon, they will beat you. In the night, they will beat you. Dawn, they will beat you. They will beat you until the time you pay the, the money, yes. You will hear guns, bah, bah, killing people, robbing them, kidnapping. Saba, Saba is not a good place. Saba is not a good place. Saba is not a good place. So as African migrants head towards the Mediterranean, they are in, almost all of them are unwittingly following the ancient caravan routes of the trans-Saharan slave trade. In the last millennium, some nine million black slaves and concubines were trafficked along these routes, heading toward Tripoli and then into the Arab world, and in some cases, Europe. Uh, but now that these old slave routes are ungovernable and awash in weapons, Tens of thousands of people who set off each year find themselves being trafficked, traded between owners, and forced to work as laborers or prostitutes. Um, the story that I wrote for The New Yorker about this was focusing on sex trafficking from southern Nigeria. Uh, but for this, I'm going to focus on the desert, uh, which shows up as like a tiny anecdote in the piece. Um, basically, the abuses are horrible. Here's an example from someone describing what happens if your family doesn't pay a ransom fast enough if you're kidnapped or tortured. You use pipe, mm -hmm. iron, electric, mm -hmm. wire. Maybe in the process you can die, they will just go and throw you inside the desert. Well, the emptiest part of the desert is called the Tenere. It's between uh, sort of central Niger and southern Libya. It's just a sea of sand, and it takes about a week to cross. And the smugglers who do this route uh, take as many as 35 people in the back of a pickup truck, but people routinely fall out of the backs of those trucks, and the drivers rarely stop. So out in the Tenere, uh, wells can be hundreds of miles apart, and a lot of people end up drinking their own urine to survive. And I also drank water from a well where someone died, like... A well where someone died? Yeah. There was someone dead inside, inside the well? Inside, uh, but I had no choice. I had to drink the water. So the reason I'm sort of starting off with these horrible accounts is because I'm now going to switch to having you hear from some of the smugglers who transport them and abuse them. And I needed you to sort of understand quite how badly they are abused, because what the smugglers have to say is, it was very surprising for me when I got there, it's sort of oddly sympathetic. So this is Agadez. It's a smuggling town in uh, central Niger. It's the southern edge of the Tenere. Its oldest walls were built some 800 years ago, 
And traders have always stopped in Agadez while crossing the desert in huge caravans uh, carrying gold and salt and ivory and slaves. And it's populated by the Tuareg primarily, but also now some Tubu traffickers who uh, historically have developed a reputation for guiding merchants through the desert and then robbing them. And the Tuareg and the Tubu are the only people who have the knowledge and the connections to actually cross through the Tenere. So that's why Agadez has become the choke point for illegal migration into Europe for anyone coming from West Africa. Uh, so for years, the Tuareg and the Tubu have been transporting illicit cargo and paying bribes to the Nigerian government soldiers and gendarmes running the country's remote desert checkpoints. Now, Niger is one of the poorest and it is the least developed country in the world. And its, uh, its government ran a sort of internal security uh, study. And the, the findings were that the bribes from the smugglers, uh, without those bribes, the soldiers at these desert checkpoints wouldn't be able to buy food or gasoline or spare parts to repair their vehicles. So I arrived uh, in the very, very beginning of November of last year. And I, had, I, I almost didn't go because um, I had sort of just missed it. The uh, three weeks before I got there, Angela Merkel visited Niger, the capital. She didn't go to Agadez. And she, she promised European development funds in return for a crackdown on illegal migration. And so after her visit, because they used to go, you'd have around 5,000 migrants leave every Monday in the convoy. And they would go on Mondays because that was when uh, the Nigerian government uh, military convoy would leave to accompany them for the first several hundred miles. And so it was safer because the desert's full of you know, various jihadi groups and bandits and all kinds of issues. And also if a vehicle breaks down, if there are several others, you can kind of redistribute the people and everyone hopefully would survive. Um, but when I got there, uh, th you know, the security forces had raided all of the uh, connection houses run by their former patrons, and the smugglers uh, were, had gone completely underground. So I went around the city looking for a guy named Mohamed Anako, who is the head of the Agadez Regional Council. It's a Tuareg tribal council that was set up in the aftermath of their many rebellions to try to sort of serve as a negotiation, uh, no negotiating uh, committee between the uh, locals and the state. And when I got to his office, I was led into a room that was filled with former rebels. And Anako, in yellow, in the back, was presiding over the meeting. So these are the heads of the biggest smuggling families in the Sahara. And I kind of arrived by accident. Uh, it turns out that they had come to, discuss, to, to discuss their grievances. And the meeting was held in Hausa. Uh, but about 20 minutes in, one man stood up and announced that he was going to speak French because he, he wanted me to understand. And so I thanked him, and then he started shouting at me. He's saying, look, we're poor. What do you want us to eat? You want us to become terrorists? We'll never become terrorists. Never. And everyone starts clapping. But we have to live. And he says, what do you want us to become? Thieves? What do you want us to do? And I was with a local fixer uh, who was terrific, a local journalist. And he goes, us? And he says, yeah, what do you want us to do? Uh, so <laughs> the local fixer diffused the situation uh, in what was sort of the for me, the least uh, intuitive way possible. Um, but because it's predominantly the EU that's cracking down, like uh, providing the funds to carry out this crackdown on migration in Niger, Ibrahim turns to the guy and goes, don't worry, he's not European, he's American. <laughs> <laughs> that actually solved it. Uh, but I had come there thinking that these guys were rich because I had read all the reports. This is a multi-billion dollar in an industry moving hundreds of thousands of people. Um, they're collecting money from ransoms after they torture people. They're collecting money from various militias to whom they sell migrants for free labor. Um, they're collecting money from the migrants themselves. Each vehicle that goes from Agadez to Sabah in southern Libya uh, takes between you know eight and fifteen thousand dollars worth of cargo as they see it. Um, but when I spoke to Anako the, at the center after the meeting, he explained how things actually worked there, and it's not at all as I had imagined. Il s'occupe plus de 100 familles à Gadez. Donc ça veut dire que le jour où il sera arrêté, le jour où il va arrêter ça, ces familles-là ne vont plus manger. 
He's saying each smuggler takes care of 100 families here. The day that they're arrested, these families won't eat anymore. It was that, in that moment that I re learned and sort of continued to report how the smugglers are the people who are keeping this town alive. They pay for their neighbor's food. They pay for the kids to go to school. They pay for everyone's medical expenses. There is absolutely no development in Agadez. There is no other economy. There is only smuggling of people and goods, weapons, fuels, uh, fuel, cigarettes, and drugs. Même moi, je suis président du conseil régional. La majorité de ces passeurs, l'autre, c'est mes neveux, c'est mes cousins, c'est oui. ça. Tout le monde est lié ici, la Gades. Tout le monde est lié. He's like, look, even me, I am the president of the regional council, but the majority of these smugglers are my nephews and my cousins. Everyone is connected here. So the next day, Ibrahim and I called up the guy who had been shouting at us, and he invited us over to his house, which is a small concrete building in a neighborhood that was the site of frequent raids. And for reasons that I won't fully understand, uh, he insisted that when I speak about him publicly, I refer to him as Albert the Gorilla. And <laughs> like Aniko, he stressed that if migration is halted, then the locals will starve. The vendors do, they profit from that. The vendors of bidons, they profit from that. The vendors of Gary Rogo, Gary Rogo, the friend of Manioc. The vendors of bois, they profit from that. 99,99% of the population of the region of Greece profit from that. When you take Durku, Agadez, Arlit, tout ça, c'est les gens qui vivent qui disent ça. Look, the water sellers, they profit from this. The guys selling, you know, fuel canisters profit from this. The guys selling flour, the guys selling wood, they all live off of this. 99% of the Agadez region, which is actually, it's not just a town, it's the region that covers more than half of Niger, uh, they live off of this, and he lists a bunch of towns. So Niger's anti-smuggling law had been passed in 2015, but it hadn't been enforced at all until now. And the government had made absolutely no effort to sensitize the smugglers to this. So uh, also, a compounding factor for the reason it was so complicated when they started implementing it is that 80% of Niger's adult population is illiterate. So he's explaining here, we don't even know the law. On ne connaît pas la loi. On ne connaît pas la loi. Personne ne connaît le contenu de la loi. C'est que on ne connaît pas. He's like, look, we don't, we, how, can we, how can they enforce this when we don't even know what's in it? So another smuggler in the room was a guy named Ibrahim Musa. There were several guys who had sort of assembled at his house. Um, and he made an odd, oddly compelling argument, a legal argument, uh, that the anti-smuggling law stood in violation of a major treaty governing practically all of West Africa. So you have Niger, as you see, is in the center, but pretty much every country to the west of it. Um, and uh, so Nigeria over, um, not counting Mauritania, but Senegal, the Gambia, all of these countries are part of the Economic Union of West African States. And it's basically a visa-free zone like the EU. If you're from one of those countries, you have every right to travel freely within the entire ECOWAS region uh, without a visa. So he's saying that you know, we're not even actually we shouldn't be legally considered to be smuggling people. You see, again, on les appelle les immigrants. Like they call them immigrants. Ce nom là, on n'est pas d'accord. We don't agree. C'est des gens de la CDAO. Hein? Ils sont chez eux, ici à Grèce. Ils sont chez eux jusqu'à Madame. They're from the CDAO, which is the French acronym for ECOWAS. He's like, they're at home at Agadez until they get to Madama, which is at the Libyan border, because Libya is not part of ECOWAS. And so, of course, they are, these guys are all lying because they do drive them into Libya, so they do cross that border, and at that point, they are smugglers. But he makes a valid point that within Niger, they're basically a taxi service. So that's Albert the gorilla insisting that he's never, never seen Libya and uh, hopes to never see it, inshallah. <laughs> uh, but this is the border of Libya and Niger. <laughs> it's an empty patch of desert controlled not by the government, but by the Tubu smugglers. Uh, as with many African borders, it makes absolutely no sense for the people who live there. And the line was drawn on the map when French colonial forces ran into the Italians. So, the Union European also, it's for them to live well, they told us to stop the Niger to stop these immigrants. And why do we not want to live? Saying, this is uh, Ibrahim Moussa uh, on the left, saying, you know, the EU, it's because they're living well that they want us to stop migration, but why can't we live too? So this is sort of creating a sense of animosity among them because for quite simple reasons, they are unable to survive without this, and not just them, but everyone they love. Um, and then he also reminded me in this moment that he and his colleagues are all ex-combatants. They have led rebellions in the past, and during the council meeting that I had accidentally walked in on, one person stopped just short of calling for another rebellion. But Moi it gets worse. 
J'ai donné un exemple, je prends du, des immigrants pour les amener à Durkou. Je rencontre migrants, 100 États armés jusqu'au Dan. Est-ce que je vais venir prévenir l'État Je ne le ferai pas, I parce won't. que je perds qu'on m'arrête. Mm. Les sécurités d'abord, ça a régné. Il n'y a rain. plus de relations entre euh, la population et l'État. Il n'y a plus de relations entre les forces de défense et de sécurité. Et l'État ne connaît pas les désirs. Ne connaît pas les désirs. Les islamistes, peut-être, ils peuvent ils entrer. Peuvent rentrer. Il dit, can, can the islamist groups in the area, will they be able to enter? And he's like, yeah, they will be able to enter. Basically, um, the U.S. views Niger as a counterterrorism partner, and they partner with the government. And part of that security arrangement is the U.S. has drones in Niger. They spy on portions of the desert. But you're looking through the drone feed from a predator or an MQ-9 is like looking through a straw. And these guys are actually the eyes and ears of the state on, in, in these areas. They don't want jihadis coming in from southern Libya. They don't want them coming in from, from Mali or Algeria. And so when they spot jihadi convoys in, he explained, we tell the government through the chain of command of the Tuareg, uh, and then the, the Tuareg leader, who is in, actually the prime minister, passes it to the rest of the government, the army, which is primarily not Tuareg, and that gets shared with the French and the Americans. So uh, this has quite serious implications because he was saying, if that line of communication, if we are afraid of getting arrested for smuggling migrants, that line of communication will absolutely break down. And closing off, I met this young smuggler named Omar. Uh, he offered to transport me into Libya, but I ended up leaving the town in a hurry because there was a, uh, an abduction threat. And so I, what I did instead was I checked with my editor first and ended up buying him a smartphone. And I was like, Omar, next time you smuggle people in the desert, just film it. You can keep the phone, but send me the tape. And he sent me this a couple months later. And I've added some voices as well. Personne ne veut emprunter le désert s'il si a les moyens de vivre ici, dans les, bons, dans les bonnes conditions ici. Le désert, là, c'est de l'enfer. Hein. Tu es toujours à côté de la mort. Tu, es tout, tu, peux, tu peux toujours t'égarer. Mais les gens qui voyaient faire ces, tra ces travaux, ces, ces, ces trajets-là, ces gens-là, c'est parce qu'ils n'ont rien à faire. Tu as vu les montagnes de la Hure, là Air mountains are just Maintenant, outside of il n'y a aucun islamiste qui peut rentrer. Aucun. Mm -hmm. Parce que la population ne veut pas. Les gens ils veulent la paix, ils veulent le développement. Salut belle. C'est comment ça va C'est bon. Mais si il remarque qu'il n'y a plus de développement, mm -hmm. c'est la prison. Dès que tu sors, on t'arrête. Mm -hmm. Là, c'est sûr que il y aura des islamistes dans les montagnes. C'est sûr. Ouais. Et le jour où il y aura, le jour où ils auront une base dans l'Aïr, mmh. le Sahel, c'est terminé. Les Américains, les Européens ne peuvent pas déloger des terroristes qui rentrent dans les montagnes. C'est comme en Afghanistan. Oui, oui, oui. Ils ont, ils, peut-être ils vont créer ce problème ils, avec l'application. Avec, avec ça, là, ils, vont, ils vont les créer ah. et l'État islamique aura raison. On sera tous à l'État islamique à la fin. That's it for me, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we have roughly 10 minutes left. We were gonna interact amongst <laughs> ourselves. We're gonna skip that. So we have microphones going around, and, and I'm gonna be kind of merciless here. Spare us the sermon or the lecture. Give us a short, pithy question, and I'm gonna use my professorial fiat and cut you off in mid-sentence if the sermon begins to uh, yeah. e emerge. So let's try and consider the sort of Washington speed dating Q&A with the journalists. So if you wanna ask a question, raise your hand, and we got one microphone, or do we have? We have two, okay, so hands. Uh, anybody who wants to pop a question? Uh, let's come up here to Catherine first. Uh, thank you. Pithy question, Ben. And identify yourself too, I'm sorry. Catherine Marshall, Berkeley Center. What do you recommend? Um, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> it's obvious that um, this community, as with many others in these transit countries like Niger and Chad, uh, are desperately in need of um, development. They want other jobs, they have none. Um, 
one of the reasons they have none is that the, they live in states uh, where the government historically has been rather predatory toward marginalized communities. And these are marginalized communities far from the capital. And that's why they fought rebellions in the past. Uh, rather than pointing to a solution, because I don't think I have one, what I would say is that um, the short-term American government and European government view is to prevent further spread of terrorism in the region, we are focusing intently on partnering with these governments. But in many cases, the governments are the root cause of the kinds of problems that drive people into terrorism. And so there has to be some sort of longer term uh, parallel uh, approach that takes that into account, at least. And that's all I can say on that. My name is Bonnie Holcomb. I'm with the Oromo Advocacy Alliance. And I, I seem to I hear that you accept this distinction between an economic and a political migrant. You uh, referred to it, at least. Sure. And I don't know about the others, too. Do you find that that is a useful or somehow workable way to refer to the people who are in this desperate mm -hmm. situation? And do you see any potential for changing that categorization at all? Uh, well, I mean, very briefly, from one I would say that right now it, it matters as a distinction because it's a legal distinction and that changes the status of whether someone gets thrown out of the country or not. Um, and on the African route, the overwhelming majority of people I met fleeing from West Africa would be defined as economic migrants. Whether or not one agrees with uh, whether terrible, terrible poverty mm -hmm. is uh, the same kind of threat to life that uh, political violence is, is uh, another question altogether that maybe someone else should answer. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I have something to say on that. I, I, the distinction between migrant and refugee certainly it matters a, a lot in terms. At least, at least policymakers are using it. The humanitarian sphere is using, using it. In Jordan, people are using it all the time. People, um, and as a journalist, I, I make the distinction because. Just because, as Ben said, yeah, there's a legal impact, and but but if you were to ask me if I think that distinction is is really meaningful or um, sometimes makes sense, I would say I think it's something that's worth challenging uh, in Jordan, particularly. I see oftentimes um, NGOs or even UN agencies. Even UN agencies, yes, and, and the government, especially the government, the government all the time. <laughs> UN agencies sometimes using this distinction, and there's this connotation that there's this kind of kind of a idea that refugees, okay, we have to accept them because you know they're fleeing and they're really suffering, you know. But be careful because many of them are liars and they're only migrants, and migrants are liars, migrants, and there's this kind of sense of migrants are just trying to get a better life and. And somehow that's not okay. It, it, it's implied that that means they're lying and cheating, and 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 it ignores the the reality that many times, yeah, people are coming from really desperate situations. And I, I think something you can think about is um, you, we say, oh, refugees are fleeing violence, and and migrants are not. They're just looking for like a higher salary, a better job, or a European life. But many times that poverty is caused by structural violence. Uh, um, many times people are in poverty because bigger, like larger scale violence has been done to them and their country through imperialism and colonialism. Just many times that distinction, I feel it doesn't really, it's not that significant and, and it can be used in, in negative ways. Um, one of the big excuses that Jordan uses oftentimes to do things like block people from coming in and seeking asylum or deporting asylum seekers or deporting refugees is by saying they're not real refugees, they're migrants. Um, or, or, or security reasons, they must be terrorists and we can't tell you why. Um, so I think oftentimes, yeah, it's a, ch it's a, it's a, it's a distinction that I think is worth challenging. I, I think, I, yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't know the origin of that use of that distinction um, in legal terms for the, for the United States or other countries, but I wonder if it emerged in the post-World War II world after the displaced people of World War II at the same time that the UN was formed as an institution that was designed not only to prevent war and genocide, um, but also to deal with its aftermath should it occur in creating this massive institution for refugee resettlement. And so now when we're in this moment when we're looking at United States refugee policy, you know, Donald Trump has just created this um, refugee 
uh, goal that is the lowest number of refugees to enter the United States in the modern history of refugee resettlement. Um, and it looks like a real um, erosion of the United States commitment to refugee resettlement. And he's now also the, his policy puts conditions on refugees in a new way, um, mm -hmm. saying that only mm -hmm. you know people worthy of res refugees who are worthy of resettlement yeah. somehow should who come will here. Who will assimilate? Yeah, who will assimilate? <laughs> um, so there, there are. It looks like at this moment, perhaps at least the United States is changing that definition already, and so maybe we're looking at a moment, um, not for the better, <laughs> but in, in my opinion. Um, where those definitions are in flux and, and maybe we're looking at a, a shift in, in the way we view those. Yeah, one, one way to call into question the definition or the distinction is really when something has such, such high stakes for you legally and such vast implications for you legally, um, the level of suffering that people are enduring at home can be exactly the same and yet one is perfectly uh, eligible for all kinds of support and one is not because, uh, but I've met plenty of economic migrants who uh, were suffering in the same way or worse than many refugees and come, seeing some of their situations back home firsthand, were I in their position, I would have done exactly the same route because mm -hmm. as one of them told me, like, we're living dead. Like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we risk, we know how dangerous the journey is. We know there's a high likelihood of us getting enslaved or killed, but like, I have nothing to live for back home, so I'll risk it. Uh, I would have too. We have time for one more very quick question. I think in the back row, the, your hand was up quickly. Uh, my name is Ismail Kushkush. I'm a journalist. Um, question to Ben. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the government of Niger's army had a convoy with the, uh, with the, I mean, is that before or after the EU's agreements before. with many of these transition governments? Okay. Yeah, so uh, every Monday there's a, Convoy, a military convoy that goes from Agadez to Durku, that's part of normal military operations. And as a result, the smugglers, up until this breaking point in uh, a year ago, um, usually accompanied the convoy because it was safer for them to go with the convoy. Uh, two quick announcements. Number one, for students, remember if you're interested in the Summer Reporting Fellowship, uh, pick up the flyer on the table in back. Uh, secondly, join me in thanking our three amazing panelists for their work. <laughs> and, and finally, thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you, John, for the, the partnership we now have with uh, the Pulitzer Center. And let's go to food and uh, conversation. Thank you all. <laughs>